Good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about engaging international relations and world politics. First, we're going to talk about states, international organizations, non-governmental organizations, and individuals. So let's start. Much of our discussion revolves around states, a geographical entity governed by a central authority. The state is traditionally viewed as the most important of three basic organizations in the previous list. A state takes the lead in attempting to defend the physical security of the population and ensures the economic welfare of its citizens, provides a focus for loyalty and identity, and claims sovereignty. This means its leaders claim to represent and exercise authority over all persons within the state's territory and claim a right to autonomy internationally. When it comes to international relations, the state dominate conventional discourse. Non-governmental movements such as insurgents and terrorist groups may attack particular states, but very often their goal is either to take over the reins of power in an existing state or to create a new state, even if broad-based political, cultural, religious movements transcend state borders, a political military entity is needed to carry out the agenda. Finally, in those areas of the world born by a overpopulation, environmental degradation, and mass migration states are expected to take the lead in developing and implementing policies to deal with this problem. Now, international organizations. States are not the only person through which to view international relations, particularly in the current era of globalization in which it is apparent that no single state can hope to be the sole agent of collective action to solve global problems. IOs play a role. IOs can be bilateral, but most are multilateral because three or more states are members. Examples include organizations with limited membership such as the North Atlantic Treaty Organizations, or NATO, the European Union, EU, the Organization of American State, or OAS, the Associations of Sudeast Asian Nations, the African Union, the best known universal, is the United Nations, membership in the United Nations is open to all states. Non-governmental organizations or NGOs and even individuals try to influence the United Nations and other international organizations and governments by lobbying or persuading international and national decision makers and their staff, holding conferences of their own and publicizing their views in the mass media, including internet websites, blogs, and social networking sites. The growth in number and activities of IOs has also been accompanied by a proliferation of NGOs actively pursuing their own objectives or agendas. Though so IOs were created by a four states, it is interesting to consider the extent to which they have come to be significant actors in their own right. Do IOs simply reflect states' interests as, at the best, provide a forum for debate? Do they become a source of financial aid or other assistance when economic or other problems arise? Do they offer an international diplomat when states come into conflict with one another? Or have IOs over time come to the point at which they now actually influence state interest, preference, and objectives? 
Wherever influence I use may have in particular functional areas such as financial loans or mediation efforts. Their key role may come to be purveyors of global norms, basic values that over time states come to take seriously. For example, while many states around the world con continue to violate human rights, over the year norms have involved that allow outsiders to make that issues. A matter of international and foreign policy, discussion and even punishment or sanction. Now we're going to talk about non-governmental organizations. As noted earlier, in recent years there has been a variable explosion explosion in the number of <coughs> non-governmental organizations or NGOs. As the term suggests, NGOs are composed of private, non-state international actors that cut across national boundaries. In this regard, we identify four, four categories of NGOs of interest private sector economic organizations. Although some writers receive the term NGOs for non-profit organizations, we apply, we apply it to all non-governmental organizations including multinational corporations MCCs, most of which are private sectors and thus non-governmental organizations, multinational business corporations and banks are understandably primarily motivated by enhancing the economic well-being or their stock and other stakeholders not necessarily the economic well-being of any one particular state. Interest in MCCs is not new. Indeed, with the US Central Intelligence Agency at the helm, the United Fruit Company played a role in the overthrow of the Arbenz regime in Guatemala in 1954, just as British Petroleum and the CIA were implicated in the overthrow of the Mossadegh government in Iran in 1953. Of particular interest to many observers of world politics, however, is the influence major corporations and banking institutions routinely have on the economies of state particularly those in the developing world depends on foreign investment. Transnational NGOs or would you rather work in non-profit transnational NGOs with explicit political, economic or social as agendas such as Amnesty International, Greenpeace and the religious organizations whose diverse memberships and global perspectives make it difficult to associate them with any one particular state. Transnational NGOs claim to have a broader constituency than MNCs or international banks. In their attempt to help define the international agenda, they often act as pressure groups to influence international organizations or states' behavior. More generally, NGOs increase global awareness of such diverse topics as ozone layer depletion, deforestation, epidemics, malnutrition and famine, religious perse <coughs> persecution, genocide, and human rights in general. They also advance agendas for dealing with such problems. Though such organizations do attempt to influence world politics by lobbying states and influencing state-sponsored meetings, their influence is actually much more pervasive and their goals much more sweeping. Humanitarian Non-Governmental Organizations The humanitarian non-governmental organizations attempt to avoid overtly political roles. The best examples are humanitarian relief organizations such as Doctors, Without Borders and a myriad of transnational programs in Africa and Asia that seek to improve the quality of life of the poor. If such, a NGOs engaged 
in politics and took sides in civil and international conflicts. It would most likely be denied access to combat zones. This and the previous category are what many people think of when the term NGO is used. In recent years, there has been a phenomenal explosion in the number of such NGOs for approximately 6,000 in 19s to more than 4,000 today. NGOs have existed for centuries. The British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society, for example, was around in the early in 80s. But the process of globalization spurred forward by the end of the Cold War and subsequent efforts to spread democratic and markets oriented values and structures, techni <coughs> technological change and economic integrations has also encouraged the growth of NGOs. The non-state armed groups, terrorists often claim to represent a broader constituency. Their ill-gotten gains is threatened in the past terrorist activity tend to be more localized, often contained by the borders of a particular state. Most recent is the globalization of terrorism by such network as Al-Qaeda, whose affiliates are said to operate in more than a thousand countries. Finally, just as states have traditionally been the focal point of citizen identity and loyalty. At last in the Western world, other entities such as the United Nations and the European Union hold the potential to be focus of loyalty beyond the state. On the other hand, and much more prevalent today, in some part of the world where state political authority is tenuous, religious or ethnic Ethnic identifications seem to be becoming a more important bond among people than any sense of loyalty or identification with a particular state. Now we're going to talk about individuals. Our focus has been on the three broad categories of organizations in international relations, but what about the average human being? Individual certainly makes a difference. Whether a Mahatma Gandhi in India or a Nelson Mandela in South Africa, but even those illustrators leader, leaders found that a cause must be associated with an organization in the form is to be achieved. We wish to emphasize, however, the wild states, international organizations, and non-governmental organizations are viewed as key actors in world politics. Such entities are made up of flesh and blood human beings. States do not make the decision to go to war. People in the government or societies do. For example, would the United States have invaded Iraq in March of 2003? If Al Gore had won the 2000 presidential election instead of George Bush, would the United States and its allies and coalition partners have decided to draw down their forces in Iraq and Afghanistan as much or as rapidly as they have had John McCain defended Barack Obama in the 2008 presidential campaign? Similarly, the states do not decide to engage in genocide or provide famine relief to parts of Africa people in their governments or society do. So, <clears throat> it is with the people who make up IOs and NGOs. But the fact of the matter is that while individuals as practitioners can have a tremendous impact on the short-term course of world events, witness Mikhail Gorbachev, the former president of the former Soviet Union, whose action contributed to the end of the Cold War, it is extremely difficult to identify such individuals until after their impact has been felt. Most people who want to influence world politics must do so in an indirect, <coughs> indirect manner through collective actors such as states, IOs or NGOs. Thank you for watching and have a good day.